Hello, subscribers and YouTube followers. We're so glad you found the Life Lessons Publishing Channel and hope it's a blessing to you. The sermons we provide on our channel were recorded while I was the senior pastor of Northwest Church in Federal Way, Washington. And our hope is that you'll grow as a disciple as you listen and watch. However, I want to tell you about another resource we have for you, our books. As a nonprofit organization, we give away our books at no charge to anyone who wants them. This isn't a gimmick or a way to get your email address. We're simply trying to fulfill the calling God has for us to equip the saints by providing solid Bible study materials for pastors, leaders, and, and you, the hungry Christian who wants to grow in your walk with God. If you're interested in receiving whichever one of these books, please email us at info, I-N-F-O, at lifelessonspublishing.com, and we'll send you a book. We won't keep your email address or try to contact you later. Our heart is for you, the committed believer, to step out in the calling God has on your life. And you need to know his word well in order to do that. Now, here's our latest video. May God bless you as you watch it. Holy Spirit, would you open the word to us now? Open our hearts to the word. We would not hear it and walk away unchanged. We would, we would obey that which is from you that we would live and be strengthened by it. In Jesus' name, amen. It's beautiful to watch someone minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything seems to flow so easily and naturally, as if that man or woman effortlessly knew just what to say or do. But ministry is never as easy as it looks. There are many personal sacrifices and inner struggles that must take place before God can consider us fit for his service. Today, as we look at the garments, we're going to look at the high priest's garments. We'll discover they were meant to be symbols which reminded the one wearing them of the price that had to be paid in order to serve as a priest of God. As we examine each of the seven articles, we'll be reminded of the price God still calls us to pay if we are to be in his service. In effect, every Christian has been summoned to be a priest of the living God. But sadly, many refuse to put on the proper garments. Perhaps it's because they decide the responsibilities are too great. Or possibly they feel unworthy of such a role. But for those who do, there is a glory and a beauty with which God clothes them. And of course, that's why when they minister, everything seems to flow so easily and naturally. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, I, you don't need to turn there unless you want to, but I, I'm just going to read you a simple statement, but a powerful one. John is giving his salutation for this prophecy, and he says from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And then he says in verse 6, this is chapter 1, and he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. When I use the word priest, it's kind of an odd word, you know. You think, well, are you talking about Catholicism? Are you talking about some of the other religions that use that term priest? And... Um, no, I'm not. The priests of the Old Testament are what we're going to look at. But I want you to understand that in the true sense of the word, you are called as a priest of God. Men and women, we are called to be priests. The English word comes from the word presbyter, which is actually a Greek word, but it means elder. And so it's, it's, it's a con, you know, kind of a conflated use of the term presbyter. It comes down to priest. Uh, an elder, an elder in the Lord. There were in Israel's life prophets, there were kings, but there were priests also. And it's a specific ministry, it's a specific calling. And what I want you to see today is that you are called as a priest, but there is a price to it. I mean, we all, I think, would know in some sense that the whole church is intended to be priests. But, you know, so was Israel. In Exodus 19, God says of Israel, I want you to be a nation of priests. I will take all of you, anoint you, and you will be my voice to the world. 
And their answer was, no way. That isn't going to happen. We want you to designate some little group and let them be, we'll treat them weird and let them be the priests and let us go about our daily business. We don't want to mess with that kind of responsibility and that kind of calling. And so they, they forced God, really, to have a select group of priests, but it was not his will. Now, of course, as the church came along, everything changed radically. God says now to his people, hallelujah, now through the redemption of Christ, I want you to all be priests. And we said, no way, we want you to give a paid little group of weirdos and make them the religious professionals and we'll go about our daily business. Didn't we? Isn't that the last 2,000 years? So there's something in people that doesn't want priesthood. And I think today we're going to see why. Because there's really a terrible price to it. A terrible and a wonderful price. There's a great reward and a great blessing, but you have to assess, will I pay the price of being a priest of the living God? And in order to teach Aaron what he would be responsible for and the attitudes that were to be in him, God designed each of the articles of clothing which he would wear to give a strong message. They're not just some elaborate duds. They are indeed statements. Statements telling him, here's something I want you to always remember as my high priest. Don't ever forget, I call, this, call you to take this step. I call you to this attitude. So we're going to go right on down them, and then we're going to apply them to ourselves. We're going to let God ask us the questions of will we also be his priests. A priest, what, are, what is a priest? Well, I, it's someone who helps people draw near to God. A king is someone who handles the government and handles the military. A prophet was a spokesman or a spokeswoman for the covenant. It would call the nation back to faithfulness to their promises, saying, come back and do what you promised God you would do. That was what the prophets of Israel are. But a priest is someone who helps people draw near to God. A priest has a role of bringing people to God. Of bearing people in his or her heart into the presence of the Lord. It's a great serving role. It is a humble foot washing role. It is a kind loving role of bringing troubled people into the presence of God. Of bringing sinful people and helping them have their sins forgiven. I mean, they're the ones who are attending to the, to the altar and helping people come and confess their sins and be right with God. That was their ministry. So a priestly role is a specific kind of ministry. Now, what attitudes did God want Aaron to have? Well, let's look at the articles of clothing. And I will read a few verses, and then I am simply going to... Uh, you can read the entire chapter at, at your leisure... Um, I will only highlight a few. Starting at chapter 28, verse 1. Lord speaking, says to Moses, bring, your, bring near to yourself Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the sons of Israel to minister as priest to me. Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. Do you notice that? They will glorify me, says the Lord, but they will also be beautiful, honoring to me and beautiful. You shall speak to all the skillful persons whom I have endowed with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister as priest to me. These are the garments which they shall make, a breastpiece and an ephod and a robe and a tunic of checkered work, a turban and a sash, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that they may minister as priests to me. And then he tells the colors that he wants, and he says, they shall take the gold and the blue and the purple and the scarlet material, and the fine linen. 
all of these garments and all of the things really in the tabernacle will be made of those four colors. They are, by the way, just offhandedly, they are the colors that we use for the four square gospel. For example, if you go right down, the gold for us represents Jesus the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. The blue is G the effort of the priest, Jesus the healer. The purple, Jesus the coming king. And the scarlet, Jesus our Savior. And so whenever you see things, you'll see those four colors. They are the basis of our four square gospel. Now he begins to go down the articles of clothing. And he starts, first of all, he says, They shall make the ephod of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet material, fine twisted linen, the work of the skillful workman. And it shall have two shoulder pieces joined to its two ends that they may be joined. So the thing is, a, it's a mantle that goes over the priest. And it has straps on the shoulders that hold the two sides and you shall take two onyx stones, they may have been emeralds, and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Six of the names on the one stone, and the names of the remaining six on the other stone, according to their birth. So like a yoke is put over the priest with the names of all the tribes of Israel, which he shall bear on his shoulders. As a jeweler engraves a signet, you shall engrave the two stones according to the names of the sons of Israel, and you shall set them in filigree. Uh, we use gold wire now for filigree. Settings of gold. And you shall put the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as the stones of memorial for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his shoulders for a memorial. First of all, the Lord says, I want an ephod put over his shoulders. Now, this is the ephod. All of that. See that? And you've got the, on his shoulders those two plates with the stones on them. And it is tied to him then with a sash. And we will see more in a minute. The Lord is saying to Aaron that he must accept responsibility for the care of others. He was to be his brother's keeper. He was to let the yoke as it were of God come over him. And bear the weight. Of all of the tribes. You know when we. Come to the Lord as a priest. There's a choice we make. Will I accept. The responsibility. To care for others. And it's a yoke isn't it. It's, it's a lot heavier yoke than you realize. A number of years ago, when we started our mini church pastor process, I remember one of the first meetings, I think it maybe was the second one we had, of, of the mini church pastors, and I, was, I stood up to speak to them, and I looked out at their faces, and I almost wept. I was deeply moved, because I saw on their faces... The strange look that comes upon pastors. I'm, I'm serious. You can see it. It's a funny look. It's a look in which you can't tell whether they're happy or sad. And the truth is, they're both. All at the same time. Anyone who begins to work with people will find that there's moments where you, you, could, you could just shout because of the answers to prayer. Somebody came to Christ and you've seen a healing and you've seen wonderful things and you're just, yes, yeah, you're ready to shout because you've seen great things of God. But at the same time, you also have had your heart broken by somebody that walked away from the Lord or some, answer, some prayer that has not gone answered or some marital thing that's just been brought to you or somebody who's struggling with their child and you're, it, it, it just makes your heart grow cold. And so you've got within you this mixed bag of feelings because you're, you've chosen to love and invest in people. It's a great burden. There's no way around it. I know some people say, well, his, his yoke is easy, isn't it? His burden is light. What he meant by that was his, he was not putting a heavy religious system on the people. He, his would be by faith that they would be made righteous. But he said in terms of following him and serving him, you got a, a cross, if I recall. 
So don't kid yourself. If you think serving God is somehow meant to be light and easy and no problem. <laughs> you're living in your own world here. People are costly. And loving people, choosing to love is costly. Any one of you who is in a serving profession, teachers, nurses, there's, there's, there's numerous things where you're, you're, you're in, the, in, the, in the job of helping people in their, in their pain. You know the struggle you go through. After a while, you know, it breaks your heart over and over again. And when you, when you love and when you open yourself and care about your patients or care about your students, you get hurt. My wife was, was for many years an emergency room nurse and she would come home at times and just break down and sob. Sometimes I'd ask what happened and then she'd tell me and then I was sorry I asked. It was horrible. And what happens in those kinds of professions is after a while you say, I, I can't stand this pain anymore and you want to close your heart off and get hard. Just to protect yourself, just to survive is what it feels like. But when you do close your heart off, something dies, doesn't it? And so you're left with either kind of dying yourself and hardening and becoming the kind of person that you don't want to be, or staying open and feeling the pain of being disappointed, or of watching someone you care about die, or watching a student fail, and having your heart broken over it. Anyone who chooses to, to, to serve, to be a priest, because all of these things are priestly roles. Anyone who chooses this is going to have a yoke over them. And he says, I want you to bear those, like a, like a, those the names of your brethren. And you bear them before me. You bear them before me and choose to love like that. So the first thing he's saying is, Aaron, Will you accept responsibility for the care of your brothers? Not just for the care of yourself. I mean, how much American Christianity is geared to you blessing yourself? Finding a gimmick, finding a particular prayer, or giving a $1,000 love offering to this ministry, or whatever it takes for you to get something from God. That's what a lot of people use their religion for. It's just as selfish as every other part of their life. They're just religiously selfish. And they're being reinforced in it because it works. And here's God coming along saying, I want, I'm calling you as a priest. I'm calling you to put the yoke on. To put the mantle over your shoulders. And to begin to love and to give and to bear your brethren into my presence. Quite a different call, isn't it? Quite a different call. The second article is, that, is the sash. You noticed around the priest's waist, there was a great sash tied to him that would held the mantle close to his body. Now the sash, the, by the sash the Lord is saying, I want you to remember that this mantle I've given you, this call to priestly ministry is held to you by my will. The mantle, I believe, represented the will of God that tied to him this calling. You know, when going is tough, when you get tired of ministry, and believe me, you will, it takes about two days. Don't you love all the people and they step out in a little bit of service and they go, oh, I got burned out. Yeah. I don't, I, I have ne I've never been in a ministry and I don't think I know anybody who finally after a while doesn't keep doing what they're doing for one reason only. Not, you know, if I stood here and say, oh, come on, come serve, the God, serve God, you'll feel so good about yourself. It's so rewarding. Well, it is, but the rewards are often outweighed <laughs> by the sacrifice, the selflessness, the loss of time, the loss of things you get to do, the loss of things you get to buy. I, I've had in the last uh, 
month or two, several conversations with young pastors. And the pastors are, are, are at this point in their development of, oh my goodness, if I don't get out of this soon, I'll be too old to get out of it altogether. That's kind of the reflection. And I've been there, and you know, it's like, I better jump if I'm going to jump. If, I've, if I stay on this boat any much longer, I'm going to have to do it the rest of my life. There's that kind of feeling. Because what happens in, as, you, as you make some of these commitments is you watch your friends go on and become enormously wealthy or whatever. And there you are plugging away, working for the Lord. And there's a scary feeling inside. What have I done? What have I done here? Was I wise? There's, there's a real assessment. And there's only one thing that will finally keep a man or woman serving the Lord. Do you know what it is? It's the will of God. If I know that I know that I know that God has set me here, if I know that this is his will for me, if I know he's placed me in this, then I, there's no, what options have I? I mean, I, I must go forward with it. And that's what gives me strength. You know, when people want to come and, and serve the Lord, if they come out of guilt, well, I read a book and I ought to be doing this, or heard a sermon and I ought to be doing this, it won't last. They're doing it because a spouse or a, or a family member is pressure, pressuring them and wants them to, to serve God in some way, and they're trying to please that person, it won't last. They'll just start hating that person. There is only one reason. If you come in it for, for, for self-fulfillment and uh, want to prove yourself somehow, it won't last. You only keep ministering because you know that you know that you know God's called you. When God has set you in a place, that's what matters. And that's what I listen for. I listen for a person who says, I know the Lord's spoken to me. I know I'm to do this. Then I know they'll stick. Because I know they can't get away from that. So tying that mantle to the priest, the Lord says, I've tied it to you with my will. Thirdly, there is a, a, a breast plate or breast piece. That is this square thing on his chest right there, which is directly over what? His heart. And there are 12 Precious gems, beautifully polished and also inscribed with the names of the tribes of Israel. And the, that square piece is a folded piece of fabric, which is sewn so that it's a pouch. Where well, the top is open, it's a pouch, and on the front of the pouch are the twelve stones. And then contained within the pouch are two stones, which are called the Urim and Thummim. No one knows exactly how they were used. So I will tell you today. It's about time someone figured this out. Yeah. They were used for guidance. And I'll actually show you in a little bit how that's used. So he has over his heart this, this statement of God. The Lord saying to Aaron, he was to cherish those who had been placed in his care. He was to think of them as beautiful gems, for this was how God saw them. Aaron, don't forget how I view my people. They are beautiful, precious gems. I want you to keep that in your heart. You know, when you minister to people, it won't be, after a while, they don't all appear to be precious gems. You know, I hear people say, well, I just, I want to go in the ministry because I just love people. I think, well... You haven't met very many, have you? And, <laughs> people have loving qualities, but people also have self and fear and anger and temper and suspicion and critical spirits and everything else. And it won't be long before they bite you. That's in fact, this is, every, every form of relationship has to be built on, a con on an integrity and an openness and a regular confession of sin and apologies to one another because we simply do bite. It's just the way life is and we have to, have to decide to do that. But when you minister after a while, you can grow hard. You can grow tired of people 
and no longer love them and begin to be angry at them. In fact, Moses himself will fall into this horrible trap and have his own heart seared toward his people as he gets older. That's another, that's another story. But the Lord says to Aaron, don't ever forget. I love my people. Remember, they're beautiful to me. Now, it wasn't going to be very long before they were going to worship a golden calf. God knew that was coming. And he says, but I want you to remember how I see them. I love them. I see them as precious gems in my sight. It's a rare weekend that I don't get weary at some stage of the game. And I begin to find myself going into a service with the attitude, well, all I have to do is just do what I did last service. And the Holy Spirit will check me and say, stop it. And I have to say, Lord, forgive me. I ask you for fresh love for your people. This is your church. They're your precious gems. This is their church service. This is not the third service. This is their church. And it must be mine again. Amen. It's a decision we make. We choose to love, don't we? We choose to refresh our hearts. We re choose to refuse the hardness or the cynicism or the, or the self-protectiveness. You choose to let it pass and to say, I will love and I will see people as you see them. He said, Aaron, if you're going to be my priest, you bear over your heart. Look at verse 29 in this chapter. He says it specifically, Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel in the breastpiece of judgment. And by the way, judgment doesn't mean condemnation, it means decision making. I'll explain that in a minute. Over his heart. Where? You put it over your heart. When he enters the holy place for a memorial for before the Lord continually, don't ever forget to love my people. Now, I mentioned that that breast piece is a folded piece of cloth forming a pouch, and that in that pouch is the Urim and Thummim. Pay, uh, verse 30 there, it says, You shall put in the breast piece of judgment, in it, you see, in that pouch, the Urim or Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. And Aaron shall carry the judgment, the decision making of the sons of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. The Urim and Thummim, no one knows for sure, but they were two stones, two gemstones, undoubtedly. And I think they were inscribed with the simple Hebrew word, yes or no. And they're kept there over the priest's heart in that pouch of love. And Israel had, if you recall, an entire system of, of, of a judiciary. They, remember the tens and the fifties and the hundreds and the thousands? They had judges over every level of things. So, and there was, there was the covenant laws. And so those judges would use those laws and they would ju uh, adjudicate, I guess, the cases that were brought to them. But some were harder than others and they'd work their way up to the top. And the last stage, the Lord says, is Moses was to finally decide, but Moses wasn't going to be around forever. And so he gave a process where they could carry before the case before the hard one, before him. And the priest in prayer and in worship could go before the Lord and reach in and come up with a decision for the people. Ultimately, God was their judge. He was their guide. He would guide his people. Aaron was to not forget that the Lord was the final arbiter. He, was the, he would be the one who would give his people their guidance. Now, I want to show you this at work. You may, you may say, where do you get? How do you know? Well, I know lots of things that, you know... 1 Samuel chapter 23, I want you to see this. David used the Urim and Thummim. And it's, it's interesting to watch it at work. Chapter 23 of 1 Samuel. 
Uh, I, gave you, I gave you another reference also, but this is the one we'll look at. David is, is on the run from Saul. All of that, he's in that stage of his life. And he has with him Abiathar, the high priest. So the priest is with him. In verse, chapter 23, verse 1, Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are plundering the threshing floors. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and deliver Keilah. Abiathar put on the ephod. He put on the breastpiece. They went and worshipped before the Lord. And then Abiathar said, O God, should David go and fight against the Philistines? And he reached in and he took out and it said yes. Now watch, it goes on. But David's men said to him, Behold, we're afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Keilah against the ranks of the Philistines? You're going to get us killed. Then David inquired of the Lord once more. And the Lord answered him and said, Again, Abiathar uh, went in before the Lord, reaches in, takes out the Urim and Thummim, says, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. Lord, will David, will David win? Will he prosper in this battle? Yes. Now, down to verse 9. Now, David knew that Saul was plotting against him, so he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the ephod here. See that? Put it on. I need you to put on the ephod with the breast, please. And then David said, O Lord, God of Israel, your servant has heard for certain that Saul is seeking to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down just as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Yes. And then David said, will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. You say, can you do that? Well, if you recall, the apostles did it. To find a replacement for, for, for uh, Judas, who had hanged himself. John Wesley, one of the great leaders of church history, would do this. He had a hat and he would put, he would put all the options. When he was really stuck, I mean, he would pray. He didn't do this a lot. But when he was absolutely stuck for an answer, he would write the options on slips of paper, put them in a hat, pray, commit himself absolutely that what he drew would be the will of God and he would do it and he would reach in and pull that thing and he did it. By George, whatever came out, that's what John Wesley did. Within the past week, we were having a decision with the, with the denomination over some matters and Pastor Jack Hayford says, in this case, I'm going to simply put, these na put the names in a hat and we're going to draw and believe that God will give us the proper names. And we don't do that all the time. That isn't some gimmick we used. But in this case, we want to be totally fair. We wanted God to pick. We wanted to have show no favoritism whatsoever. And so we pick, he picked. And we just, we prayed first, waited on God, and then drew. And trust that God guided the process. That is not unbiblical. It is not wrong. Now, first of all, you want the Holy Spirit. You want the guidance and principles of the Lord. You wouldn't use this as a regular gimmick. This was not for them a gimmick. This was an end of the line. We really need your counsel on this. And he said, uh, Aaron, you should be seeking my guidance for the people. You as a priest, help them find my will. Number five, the robe. Now I want to point out the robe. This blue part is a one-piece of fabric. It has a hole up there for his neck and it's heavily reinforced so that it may not be torn. Along the bottom of the robe are bells with little puffs of fabric from the weaving of the robe that they call pomegranates. Uh, 
And so as he went about his ministry, there was a, a, a ringing sound of these little bells, particularly when he went into the Holy of Holies once a year on the day of Yom Kippur. Uh, they would listen for the bells because in some cases the high priests were smitten dead and they would drag them out by a rope. So good to have the bells. <laughs> now I believe that the, the robe spoke of his righteousness and integrity, which should remain untorn. Now the interesting thing is Jesus had a robe. And his was made, you find it in John 19, I won't take you there, but you can look it up later, I'll give you the reference. And some, some loving heart had made him a priestly robe. And it's a very complex, you know, all of this checkered weave. And it's a very, very fine piece of fabric. It's, a, it's, it's twisted linen. It's a beautiful thing. And you recall that when the Lord was on the cross, they took most of his garments and they would rip them in four. And the, and the soldiers would just take and go sell that thing in the, in the auction next to the temple or whatever and make some money off of the stuff they were crucifying. But they came to this robe of his, his tunic. And that was too fine. And so they, ra they um, cast lots for his robe. It was to remain untorn. The Lord also, by the way, had a scarlet robe over that. If you recall, Herod in, in mockery had put a robe on him. And he also had a crown. Even as the priest has a crown, he too had one, but his was of thorns. The Lord had seen that his son would be dressed as a high priest as he did his ministry for us. There was a hole through which the head was put. It was of one piece and not to be ripped. It was sky blue in color with bells as he moved. Speaking of his integrity. Aaron, if you're going to be my high priest, your integrity must remain intact. You are to be a righteous and a holy man. You are to resist temptation. You are to resist the bribe. You are to walk purely before me in all things. Then there's the turban. That's the turban on, the, on his head. And you'll notice on the front of it is a gold plate. The, the Hebrew word actually is petal, like a flower petal. And inscribed on that is our Hebrew word saying, holy to the Lord. Right over his forehead, holy unto the Lord. The Lord was saying, Aaron, you're to have a new way of thinking about yourself. You are now set apart for my special use. You do not belong to yourself anymore. The word holy most fundamentally means set apart from one use to another. What was once being used one way is now holy and is only to be used this new way. Anyone who's going to be a priest of God... When God calls you into this step, it's not something you can back out of. When you say yes to the Lord, when you give yourself to the Lord, it is not yours to ever take yourself back again. You are literally saying from this day forward, my life belongs to God. I'm not my own anymore. It is not about my goals. It is not about my fulfillment. It's not about my happiness. It's not about my success in life. It's not about my finances. I now am a servant of God given to his service from here on out. Remember I said earlier that we're all called as priests, but if you actually look at the church-wide, very few people answer the call. As we go through this, it becomes apparent why, isn't it? I said there's a price of priesthood. And there's a whole lot of people who say, no way I'm paying that price. I want to get my hide out of hell. I want to get into heaven. I want to do whatever minimal thing I have to do to sort of keep from going to hell. I'm afraid of that. Good. Wise. But I want to if I can get through life with doing as little for someone else as possible, I want this to be about me. And then along comes the Lord and says, I've called you as a priest. I've called you to die to that. I've called you to come and serve me and lay up treasure in heaven, not here on this planet. And finally, 
He had a tunic and a sash. The tunic's like a, a long nightshirt. It's this thing, the white thing. It goes all the way down to his feet, and you, you can see the arms coming out. It's, it's a, like, a, like a nightshirt of, of finely woven linen underneath. And I'm not taking you to the verse that I believe reveals its meaning, but it's there. I give it to you, Isaiah 22, 21. God had clothed him with spiritual authority. The Lord is saying, don't use your own authority. I will give you the authority you need. I want you to walk in my authority, not your own. Not manipulation, not dominance. Let me clothe you with true spiritual authority. Let me put it on you. And it will be my authority that you use. Now, here we go. I want you to listen. And I'm going to go right through these issues. And I'm going to ask you. Actually, I believe the Lord is asking you. What is your answer to the call to be a priest? Are you willing to pay the price of priesthood? Listen, here's first of all the Lord speaking saying, Will you allow me to put on your shoulders the burden of caring for others? How about it? It's going to cost your time. It's going to cost your energy. It's going to cost your emotions. You're going to have, be stuck loving people and hurting. There'll be times you're so tired, there's nothing in you will want to serve. Are you willing to say, Lord, put over my shoulders your mantle. Put them on me. I'm wearing to bear, willing to bear on my shoulders those stones with their names engraved, like a yoke. The Lord would say to us, will you refuse to quit? Will you refuse to quit because I'm the one who called you? The sash is around your waist. Will you let me put that there and hold this mantle on you? For I'm the one who called you. It's my will, not yours. Number three, the Lord says to us, Will you open your heart and love them as I do, seeing them as precious gems in my sight? Will you constantly renew your vision of the people I give to you, to love them, to see them as I see them, to refuse to grow bitter and hard or judgmental toward them, but to see their beauty and to let your love go for them? Number four, the Lord would say to us, will you submit your tough decisions to me and accept my will? Will you seek my guidance in all things? Number five, will you struggle against temptation and keep your integrity intact? Will you wear the robe? Will you put the robe on, the untorn robe, sky blue in its purity? You know, people, there's only one reason for me well, I, there's a lot of reasons. I take that back. That I would walk in, I, I, that I, I, I do everything I know to do to walk in integrity and purity. And it's not because I'm some sort of prude. I don't want to lose the anointing. If I didn't have the anointing, I'm absolutely sunk. I think any ministry, any ministry at all, is absolutely overwhelming apart from the anointing of God. You, uh, you must, all of us, we draw on God over and over again. And one of the ways the devil goes after us to tempt us, in fact, let me tell you something, the more you step out as a priest, the more you move in your ministry, the more aggressive you become in the things of God, the more you'll be tempted, not less. Devil's no fool. He's going to try to take you down. And it becomes quite the struggle, quite the process of focusing on your mind and saying, I will not allow money, sex, power, anything else, lies. I will not entertain the tools of the enemy. I will put the robe on and it will be untorn. Will 
Will you think of yourself as my servant? Listen, and never again pursue your own goals. Holy unto the Lord. And finally, will you wait for the Holy Spirit to give you spiritual authority and not try to minister without it? Well, if the price of ministry is so great, what on earth makes it worth doing? I mean, Steve, you've gone through the hardships and you've, let, you've convinced us of the price. What's the, what's the positive side of this? Well, first of all, if you know you're called, once you really understand, and, and many of you have already seen, your eyes have seen, you understand the reality of the spiritual world. And that's young and old. I was talking to a young person the other day, and that, that, that young man saw and understood the nature of life as clearly as anybody who's 75 years old and has lived a life. He saw, he understands, he's already bitten. Well, first of all, you'll never be happy doing anything else. When you know you're called, when you understand the nature of life, I mean, how many boats can you buy? I mean, how many times can you get taken a picture in front of your new car or whatever? At what point does it, you realize, this is worthless, man? See, you're not made for that. You're made for eternal business. You're made for eternal business. It has nothing to do with your income. It has nothing to do with social status. It has nothing to do with it. You're called as a priest of the living God. And the business that you're assigned is the most important work on planet Earth. It's bringing lost people to God and to their eternal life. And they will thank you forever. Secondly, you simply love seeing his spirit minister through you. You know, when you feel the Holy Spirit use you and minister through you, there is nothing sweeter. It's just the greatest thing in the world. It's to sense God at work through you. How many of you know what that feels like? You know what it is to have God move through you. Isn't it wonderful? Is there anything better than that? Thirdly, you understand that your sacrifice is producing eternal fruit. Yes, it's costly. Yes, it's costly. But you also will see the fruit. God says, I've, I've called you to bear much fruit. And as you walk in the priesthood of God, as he's called you, you'll bear much fruit. Men or women, young or old. God will use you beyond what you would expect. And you know it's eternal. And you know, you've, you, you, you know, when I talk to those pastors, I mentioned earlier, they have called me on the phone and talked to me, you know, as they're moaning and groaning kind of about some of the, boy, they, they've, they've engaged the fact that they're really in a, 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 a self, selfless kind of calling. I said, I went through that big time. But I said, let me tell you something when you get old. I said, if you think for a moment that I'm somehow sorry that I've invested my life in serving people, that, I mean, imagine yourself on your deathbed going, oh man, I spent my whole life bringing people to Jesus. Oh, what a waste. <laughs> Isn't going to happen, is it? No. But there's an awful lot of people that say, I spent my whole life pursuing riches and they're now going to be left to my nephew. Now, there's a lot of people who live, come to their deathbed with regrets. But I don't think I've ever heard anybody regret that they served the living God. If you've ever had a close, a close call with death or felt you had a life-threatening disease, yeah, you ever had that happen? I'll tell you what's important to you. I've had one of those. Your family... And Jesus. Everything else is dust. And finally, you'll discover that when you suffer, now hang on to this, this is a little bit. When you suffer for Jesus, it somehow draws you closer to him. Paul says we're to make up the, the, the sufferings of Christ. We, as his people, he is still suffering 
for the salvation of the world, as it were, through his people, as his people are persecuted and dying, as his people are bearing the weight of the pain of this world, bringing his love, the body of Christ still suffers in the redemption. And there's something about when you, when you, when you, when you pour out, the Lord draws so close to you, and you can just sense him saying, thank you, sweetheart. Thank you for your love. Thank you for joining me in the redeeming. It draws you close to him. So is there a reward? Oh, yeah. There's real treasure. Is there a cost and a price to priesthood? Very much so.